Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, coming out today, and if you're visiting, uh, we'd like to welcome you as all, uh, also. And if you need uh, communion, if you raise your hand, we'll help you get that uh, as we get started. Uh, a few things coming up will be uh, this afternoon, 5 p.m. devotion. And then Wednesday at 7 p.m. for the Bible study, and then back 10:30 a.m. Saturday for uh, Brian's Bible class. Um, we had uh, heard great news this past week that uh, Nancy Davis was baptized at the Kerry meeting, so uh, that was great. Uh, a few things coming up. It was good. Be I'm sorry. Be yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Betty Davis. Yep. A couple of other things. Uh, Last of Leaders is coming up on the 29th through 31st. And again, if you're uh, able, there's a box in the back. If you're able to bring any supplies like uh, food or water or snacks just to help, the, help them out while they're gone. Uh, there's a church cleanup day on May the 11th from 9 to 11. And then the uh, spring gospel meeting will be May 19th through the 22nd with Jacob uh, Evans. Uh, and there's some... Uh, there's some uh, descriptions of the classes he'll be having uh, during those gospel meetings in the bulletin. So please pick up a bulletin if you don't have one. Uh, let's see. Uh, a few things on the prayer list will be a uh, friend of Sandra Stevens, Kathy Kicklider, has issues from surgery. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Melinda's traveling to, uh, well, back to visit uh, Andy and Hannah for three weeks. I think she's leaving Thursday, so keep her in her prayers while she travels. And David Jones from the Tri-City School of Preaching is having some uh, tests coming up. I think that's it on announcements. So there are several in the prayer list uh, on the, in the bulletin, so if you don't have a bulletin, again, pick one up, please. And with that, uh, as we begin worship, let's go to God in prayer. All right, God, thank you for the uh, day you've given us and for uh, our blessings and uh, the beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for meeting our needs this morning, and uh, Lord, we're especially uh, privileged and honored to be able to come uh, together today as a congregation and, and meet and uh, study your word, and, and dear Lord, uh, we're honored again to uh, honor you this morning as uh, we begin our worship. Lord, we pray for all the upcoming events. We pray for the last leaders event as the as, uh, members. Here, take the uh, children to uh, this event, and Lord, we pray for safe travels for them. We pray for uh, that uh, those kids continue to grow in your word. Lord, uh, we pray for those that were listed on the prayer list, and uh, Lord, there are many others listed. We pray for those and their, their caretakers and their families. And Lord, begin uh, worship this morning. Uh, be with Brian as he delivers the message, and Lord, be with us as we... Uh, as we take that message, apply it to our lives, and go out and share with others. All right, dear God, we pray all this in uh, your son's name. Amen. Our first song is number 678. 678. Let us sing. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. 
Grant that all may seek and find the uh, God supremely kind. Number 384. 384. In your book, number nine thirteen nine one three. That'll be our song of invitation after this morning's lesson. Now turn to number seven seventy eight. Seven seven eight. After the singing of this song, we will have the Lord's Supper together. Give.
Good morning. Good morning. Does everybody have uh, a bread and a juice? Jackie, we need one up here, please. If you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll read a few verses um, starting at 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on this night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is an un, in an unworthy manner will be, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let us pray for the bread. <clears throat> Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day, so thankful for this opportunity of worship, and at this time of worship, during our worship service, uh, this opportunity to partake of uh, this bread that represents Jesus' precious body that he gave so freely on that cross at Calvary. Lord, we pray as each of us here partake of that, we examine ourselves and think back to that great sacrifice and the suffering that our Christ made for each of us. As we partake of this, we pray that we do this in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us now pray for the cup. Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, in, in like manner, um, we are thankful for this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood that he poured on, he poured out on that cross at Calvary. Lord, we pray that each of the souls here that are partaking of this um, examines their selves and, and thinks back to that day. We pray that we each do this in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Um, as you exit the auditorium at the end of services, there's a box to your to your right. Um, if uh, you would like to uh, make an offering, at this time, let us pray for the offering. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all that you give us. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy and your love, Lord. All the physical blessings we each share here on this earth we are so thankful for lord at this time as we give back of a portion of our blessings of how we've been blessed we pray that we each do this with a cheerful heart and a, and a giving heart lord we pray that these funds that are given are are, are used properly uh, we pray for those the men that are uh, make the decisions of how these funds are used and we pray that all of this um, is to help further your, your kingdom here on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. 
in preparation for Brian's lesson today. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And when you pray, you shall, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they have to pray standing, or excuse me, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for all their many words. Excuse me, for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. I must be begin by asking for your forbearance this morning. I, uh, I woke up with a headache today. Um, got a little bit of a migraine going on. So, um, so just bear with me through that. It, uh, if you've ever had one, you know it sometimes can cloud your, your thinking. So, uh, but I appreciate you being here. Let me again say thank you to, uh, to Duane and the other men, uh, Cy and, and those who've led us this morning um, in, in this worship service. It's just an awesome blessing to be here, and I'm so glad you are. This morning, I want to spend just a little bit of time in discussion about prayer. Asking the question of myself, and hopefully you'll ask it too, is have I been neglectful of my prayer life? And, uh, and hopefully I can broaden that, that idea or concept in this study about uh, when we talk about prayer life, that of course encompasses, um, uh, you know, kind of a big part of our lives, hopefully, <laughs> or it should be, uh, and hopefully we're expanding that. But uh, one of my favorite um, characters within Scripture, so many, uh, that you could name, I can name all of them actually. The preacher says that's his favorite, and then this person's his favorite, and that's his favorite text, and that's his favorite text, and so on. But I love Hannah. She is such a wonderful example, I think, of someone who, who should demonstrate such great faith in the midst of a very um, a tumultuous time for her, something um, that she was obviously struggling with. When you look at the text in 1 Samuel chapter 1, as the, the writing of Samuel is introduced to us, we're immediately introduced to, uh, to Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, and her plight in life. Um, the text tells us that um, even though Elkanah had, had tried to um, you know, provide well for her and had tried to uh, satiate some of, some of her trouble in her life, uh, the text says in verse 5 that he gave her a double portion. He loved her so much. Yet the text lets us know that, um, that Hannah had not been able to have any children. And, and this was something that was a deep um, desire of her uh, to have children, and yet she was not allowed to. To, to make the matter worse, and there's so many echoes of what we read here and in the life of Sarah. Uh, you, there, there's such a similarity in, in so many ways of their situation. But she has uh, a rival who is provoking her, who uh, seems to be making fun of her. Uh, as you continue to read, the text says that, that she, would, um, she, she would have these bouts of depression where she would not eat, she was crying. Uh, Elkanah says to her at one point, you know, why are you sad? Um, am I not more to you than ten sons? I mean, obviously, he, here's a man who's trying to do what he thinks is best to provide 
um, help and, and support, and yet uh, maybe he's missing the mark just a little bit here in his understanding of his wife. Uh, but it's not out of anything but love from him. And as you continue to read and you get later in the text, uh, verse 10 tells us that when they went to the temple, again, she seems to be reminded of her situation. And verse 10 says that she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. This is one of those those times when you cry and... I may have said this before, this is kind of like an ugly cry. This is the cry you do in secret when, when, when you're away from everybody else, and you can just open up, and it doesn't really care how you look. Um, you're not worried about that in that moment, uh, but you're just trying to open yourself up to God and, and, and to let Him hear from you. Uh, not that God doesn't know, but that, that you're just trying to share with Him uh, this, this thing that's going on. Verse 13 tells us that when, I'm um, oh, sorry, let's, uh, verse 11, the end of verse 11, and she prays out to God, uh, but will uh, to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And so she, um, she's praying for this covenant with God. Um, she says, basically, God, if you'll provide to me a son, I'll give him right back to you. Uh, and... And so that's what she's doing as you get to verse 12. And this is where the, the high priest Eli comes into the picture. He comes out there and he sees what's going on. And at first he's greatly disturbed, imagining what, what she's doing. But verse 13 says that she was speaking in her heart. Um, you, you've done that, right? You've been in your mind at a different place than you were, uh, maybe where you physically were. Um, that's what she is. She's, she's in a different place in the moment. She's opening up to God from her heart. Uh, she tells later, uh, she tells uh, Eli after he accuses her of being drunk, she says, I've been pouring out, verse 15, I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. And so here's a woman who, her only avenue is prayer. She has nowhere, to, nowhere else to turn to. And she's turning wholeheartedly to God. She doesn't have medical facilities to go to to help fix this situation. She doesn't have, um, you know, any magical pill to take to, to cure her, her ailment. All she simply knows is, I'm, I have God. And as you read the text you find out that God has responded to her Eli the prof or Eli the high priest um, prophesies to her in verse 17 and says go in peace the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him let your servant find and then she responds she says let your servant find favor in your eyes then the woman Hannah went went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. And as you read the text, you, f you find out that God fulfills this to her. She ends up having a Samuel. But for our thoughts this morning, I am thinking about Hannah and where she is. And I think this is where we should live. I think this is where we should live. Not in her depression, but in her, her outreach to God. In the way she approaches God. Could you imagine the power of the prayer of a Christian who was in this same mindset all the time that she was? I think it would overwhelm Satan and all of his attacks. And, and so you think about prayer and, and how far too often we overlook it. There's a couple of questions I want to consider. Number one, the question of when should we pray? You think about Hannah, and, and she prayed in her desperation, didn't she? And she made the best use of her trip to the temple. When should we pray? Well, I would say, number one, a great time to pray is in the morning. In the morning, when you get up, when, you're bef when your feet are hitting the floor for the first time and you're beginning your day, maybe you ought to give some attention to prayer. Maybe I should do that. The psalmist in Psalm 5, Psalm 5 and verse 1, he says to God, 
Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For you, for to you <coughs> do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. The implication is there. She's waiting for God to fulfill uh, his prayer request that he makes to him. I, I think beginning our day in prayer would be the best way to start any day. So pray in the morning. I think number two, we should pray at the midday. In the afternoon, we should lift our prayers up to him. Consider what you're doing in the middle of the day and how the world presses in among you or uh, upon you and how wonderful it would be to take a moment in the middle of that to say, God, thank you. God, please bless me. God, please be with me. How wonderful that would be and how great that might, uh, how great of a tool that might be in resetting your mind and your day as you continue to live. I think we should pray in the morning. I think we should pray at the midday. And I bet you can guess we should pray at night, in the evening. Um, in our class this morning, we were looking at uh, Judas, and we began in Luke chapter 6. Do you remember our Lord who sets the perfect example for us? What does the text say as he is approaching this big decision of selecting his 12 apostles? What does he do? The text tells us in uh, Luke 6 verse 12, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night... He continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose them, uh, chose them twelve, whom he named apostles. He prayed all night. Now, I'm not saying you should pray all night, obviously. But there are times when maybe that would be necessary. We've had, we went through those things, right? When maybe a night of prayer was what we needed more than rest but we should I think uh, end our days in prayer I think that would be a valuable resource for us and that's something we should make a part of our everyday life we should pray in the morning we should pray in the new uh, at the midday in the noon and we should pray at night in the evening ultimately we should pray at all times and that's the kind of the idea that uh, Paul presses upon us, isn't it? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 5, 17, or 16 through 18, uh, specifically verse 17. But if you notice in verse 16, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice always. Where's the outlet for our rejoicing? It should be in prayer, shouldn't it? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in, um, in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Our lives should be patterned by prayer. I think it would be wonderful for all of us to, to set out a pattern or a schedule for praying. That, that our prayers... There's nothing wrong with, with, with the same time every morning I get up and this is part of my routine. When I go to bed at night, this is part of my routine. When I'm eating a meal, this is part of my routine. This is just what I do. And then, of course, there's the many other times that we offer prayers. In Psalm 55, verse 16, the psalmist again calls out to God. He said, but I call to God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. When should we pray? Prayer should be a part of, of every element of the Christian life. It's what we should do. It's who we should be. Um, and so Christians ought to be models of a prayerful being. When should we pray? And then secondly, what are the ways in which our prayers may be hindered. What are some things that get in the way of our prayer life? What are some things that can cause disruption to our effectiveness in our prayers or to the effectiveness of our prayers? 
Let me offer with you a couple of things I think are important. Number one, our prayers are hindered when there's active sin in our lives. Um, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. What does the prophet Isaiah say to Israel in regard to their prayers to God in the midst of their sin? He says, Isaiah 59 and verse 1, Behold, the, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear. It's not anything to do with God. It doesn't have anything to do with God's power. It doesn't have anything to do with God's benevolence or God's omnipresence. But what does it have to do with? It has to do with us. He says, but your iniquities, your sins, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So that he does not hear. When, there, when we are actively participating in a life of sin, we have made a separation between us and God. Sin separates us from God and it separates us from his love. It separates us from his mercy and his grace, from his aid, his providential care. The first thing we should consider is bringing ourselves back to God, of stopping the sin in our lives and rededicating ourselves to him. In uh, John chapter 8, when we read about the woman caught in adultery, what does Jesus say to her at the end? He doesn't simply say to her, where are your accusers? And she say, well, they're not here. Jesus didn't go on to say, well, go in peace and be merry, does he? He says, go and sin no more. Sin like adultery and, and other things like that Make a separation between us and God so that, as the text says, he will not hear us. Israel was in active rebellion against God. And because of that, God had taken his protection away. Our, our prayers are hindered, hindered when there's active sin in our lives. Our prayers are hindered when we ignore, and this may be closely related, ignore unresolved conflict unresolved conflict. I'm going to look at a couple different examples here. If you go back to Matthew chapter 6, which is uh, in that text that Steve shared with us. But if you go on down after Jesus delivers an example of how the apostles ought to be praying, he, he, he ends that section by talking about the concept of forgiveness. He says... Uh, Verse 14, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. However, he goes on in verse 15 to say, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses or sin. Our forgiveness is conditioned upon our willingness to forgive others. As Christians, we cannot hold on to, to anger and to hatred uh, or to resentment. We can't allow conflict between us and others just to go on unresolved. We have to deal with those things. Um, we have the example that Peter gives us in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. What does Peter say to husbands? in regard to their wives. Talking about the marital relationship. Do you have any unresolved things going on in your marriage? You ought to listen to this, right? Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And notice this. How does he end it? so that your prayers may not be hindered. When we mistreat each other, 
don't expect God to listen. When we harm one another and we allow that harm to continue on, don't expect God to hear you. In order for our prayers to be heard, we must seek peace in our lives with those around us. Matthew gives us this example in Matthew 5 and verse 23 in discussion about worship. I know the context is worship. I don't want to miss that. But notice what he says. I think the principle applies even to prayer. Matthew 5 and verse 23. He says, So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, don't offer it yet, leave there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Um, part of worship is seeking peace in our lives with those that may have something against us. Jesus says we should seek resolution. We should seek reconciliation with those in our lives. I think the same is true with our prayers. We should seek to resolve conflict. And then also as we think about things that may hinder our prayers is our prayers may be hindered I didn't put this one up there, so hold on to that one. You saw that one ahead of time. Um, our prayers are also hindered when we ask amiss of godly purposes. Our prayers are hindered when we ask amiss from or of godly purposes. What do our prayers consist of? Are they things that bring honor and glory to God and to his kingdom? Are they things that we pray to help to extend the kingdom or our work in it? Or are they things that we ask from a selfish, self-centered attitude? James clears this up for us in James chapter 4 in a discussion about praying for godly wisdom and why some prayers go unanswered or um, un, um, un, ungiven by God. Notice what he says, James 4. He says, verse 3, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Well, what was wrong about their request? To spend it on your passions. And then he goes on to say to them, You adulterous people. Adulterous people. Why is he calling them adulterous people? Why be so harsh, James? Well, it all had to do with what motivated them. They weren't motivated by godly desire, but were motivated by selfishness. He goes on to say, do, uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't want to be an enemy of God. So if I don't want to be an enemy of God, I need to put aside my selfish desires my longing of my flesh, and seek after God. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. John writes to us and he says, This is the confidence. This is the confidence that we have toward him. We can be confident in coming before God when we do this. That if we ask anything according to his will, what? He, um, um, his will, he hears us. He hears us. Verse 15, and if we uh, know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that what we have requested um, that we have asked of him. And so if we want to be heard by God, we need to ask according to his will. Our prayers are hindered when selfishness becomes a part of our prayer life. And then finally, on this thought, asking about what hinders our prayers, our prayers are hindered when we lack faith in God's power to answer. When we lack faith. 
In Hebrews chapter 11, in that great discussion on faith, Hebrews chapter 11, you remember he begins in verse 1 by describing what faith is. That is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I like that verse. I also like verse 6 in a description of faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, he goes on to write, And without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must, must believe that he exists and what? And that he is a rewarder of those who <laughs> seek him. Faith, and uh, one of the major elements of faith is a belief in God to do what he promises. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1 verse 5, James says, If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him, what? Ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Ask in faith. When we go to God, we must not be as Matthew 6, 5 through 8 tells us, we must not be like the hypocrites who approach God with all kinds of um, highfalutin talk, with haughty and, and prideful words, but we must seek to speak to God honestly and seeking to do the will of Him. And that's why He tells us in Matthew 6 and verse 6, when you pray, what should you do? Go into your secret place. God sees in secret, and he will reward you openly. Why should we go to our secret place? Because God understands us. In our secret place, that's where we're the most honest. And that's where we can be the most honest with him. As we, as we close this out, we're left with, with this idea that prayer... Prayer is vital to our spiritual well-being. If your prayer life is not healthy, then I will say to you, you're not healthy spiritually. You need to get that right. Our spiritual life is vital to being a healthy child of God. In James, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 13, James writes to us, and he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Our first turn should not be to mankind, but our first turn should always be to God. I'm not saying don't go to doctors, don't seek out medical treatment. Those things are valuable. Those things are gifts from God. But they shouldn't be the first thing we think about. Our first turn in any situation, any difficulty in life, should be to God. Is anyone, among, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them, what? Pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. If, if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. You know, I think of a powerful example uh, my wife and her talking about her health battle many years ago and how she turned to the church and they came together and they prayed for her. And, uh, and I think about this passage and what's the promise here? The prayer of faith has great effectiveness, right? The prayer of the church has great power in it to heal the one who's sick. And this is not about uh, just about our physical health. That's not what I want to concentrate on and about some magical cure. What I want us to concentrate on is the power of offering our prayers up to God. If anyone has committed sin, he will be forgiven. When what happens? When he 
goes to God in prayer, when he turns from his sin and he turns back to God in prayer. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. As we close out here, I want to turn to 1 Kings 18, a great example of the prayer of a man named Elijah. As he is on the mountaintop facing down um, the prophets of Baal, uh, I believe the number is 400 prophets he stands up against. And there he is on one side by himself physically, yet we know God is standing behind him and with him. And then on the other side, you have all those false prophets, all those worshipers of the idol Baal. You remember what happens. Um, they, they, uh, Elijah puts before them a challenge to see which God will hear. Will it be the God of Baal? Or will it be the God of Elijah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? In verse 24, 1 Kings 18, Elijah says to those prophets, he says, uh, and you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. You may remember that word there is the name of God in the original text, Yahweh. And, God, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. As you continue in that text, you remember what happens. At first you have those prophets of Baal begin to offer up their prayers, asking for Baal to, to, to come down and to you know, accept this sacrifice, to burn it up. And despite their continuing calls, despite their, their even cutting themselves, nothing happens. And so after a certain period of time, and they've given up, they understand that's not going to happen today. Even at one point, Elijah says, well, you might need to call out louder because maybe he's on holiday or maybe he's sleeping. Of course, there, there is no response from that empty idol. And then finally, in verse 36, it was at the time of the offering of oblation that the prophet Elijah goes to God, and he calls out to God. He says in verse 36, O Lord God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that uh, this day that you are God in Israel, and that your servant... And, uh, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, uh, sorry, uh, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the, uh, the Lord, Yahweh, He is God. The Lord, Yahweh, He is God. God answers the prayers of the faithful. He is attuned to our request. He understands our desires as we offer them up to them. And He is responsive. When we don't neglect him. Because really in neglecting our prayer life, we are neglecting God. We're saying something about how important God is in our lives, though we may not realize it. Our prayer life is the lifeblood of our relationship with God in so many ways. It is in prayer that we offer up to him our concerns, our thanksgiving, that we ask for direction in our lives. And so as we conclude, we come back to the question of, have I neglected my prayer life? What kind of shape I, am I in or spiritually? A lot of that has to do 
with the condition of my prayers. This morning, as we think about your relationship with God, the first question we have to ask is, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Do you wear the name of Jesus? You know, I think about those very first Christians on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And after hearing Peter preach upon the great Savior Jesus and how Jesus was the Son of God and yet he was also the Son of Man, how he came and left heaven and came to bear our sins on himself, that it was through him that we can be saved. They cry out in verse 37, Men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter responds and says, Repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. See, in order for God to begin to hear our prayers before our prayer life can become what it can be, number one, we need to be a child of God. Are you a child of God? If not, I ask why. The prescription is easy. Jesus has done the hard part for us. It just is God waiting on us to respond in faith, to repent of our sin, to change our mind, our focus of our life, to begin to change our desires, to make them not about us, but about God. To repent, to confess Jesus as Lord, just as the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. And to live a life of confession. And to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of our sins. Galatians 3 and verse 27 says that when we are baptized into Christ, it's at that moment we are clothed in him. This morning, are you clothed in Christ? If not, why would you wait any longer? Are you a Christian? Just for many of us are Christians here this morning. And so we ask the second question. How's your prayer life? What does your prayer life say about your spiritual well-being? About your relationship with God? This morning we'd love to take time to pray together for you. Remember what James said? Let him who has sin in his life turn to where? To the church? This morning, if you have sin in your life, if you're a Christian who's walked away, not been what you should be, now would be an awesome opportunity for you to turn back to God. We're going to sing a song together. We're going to offer you an opportunity to do that very thing. If you have any need, any need at all, please come as together we stand and as we sing. Come to Jesus, He will save you. Though your sins as crimson.
Please turn to number 549. 549. I know the Lord. Our final song will be number 491. 491. Thank you for coming today. Please be careful going home. Now we'll be closed in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as our worship this morning comes to an end, we pray that it was 
uh, pleasing to you and glorifying to you. We pray that our hearts were in the right place, and if they are not, that we get them in the right place. Uh, we thank you for the wonderful message we received. We pray that we'll take it with us and apply it to our life. We'll apply it to our prayer life, and and we uh, uh, hope that our I pray that our prayer life will become stronger. We pray for the kingdom that we may go out and be the light of the world and strengthen the kingdom uh, as we go forth this week. Uh, we pray that that we. We continue to live and live in a manner pleasing to you and that glorifies your kingdom and grows your kingdom. Keep us safe until our next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen.